Section 48 of the Essays of Samuel Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim McDougall. The Essays of Samuel Johnson. Section 48. Our Present State, One of Danger and Infelicity. Saturday, December 29th, 1753. Ultimus Semper expectanda dies homini, DCK beatus anti obitum, nemo supremaque, funera debet. Ovid. But no frail man, however great or high, can be concluded blessed before he die. Addison. The numerous miseries of human life have extorted in all ages an universal complaint. The wisest of men terminated all his experiments in search of happiness by the mournful confession that all is vanity, and the ancient patriarchs lamented that the days of their pilgrimage were few and evil. There is indeed no topic on which it is more superfluous to accumulate authorities, nor any assertion of which our own eyes will more easily discover, or our sensations more frequently impress the truth, than that misery is the lot of man that our present state is a state of danger and infelicity. When we take the most distant prospect of life, what does it present us but a chaos of unhappiness, a confused and tumultuous scene of labor and contest, disappointment and defeat? If we view past ages in the reflection of history, what do they offer to our meditation but crimes and calamities? One year is distinguished by a famine, another by an earthquake. Kingdoms are made desolate, sometimes by wars, and sometimes by pestilence. The peace of the world is interrupted at one time by the caprices of a tyrant, at another by the rage of a conqueror. The memory is stored only with the vicissitudes of evil, and the happiness, such as it is, of one part of mankind, is found to arise commonly from sanguinary success, from victories which confer upon them the power not so much of improving life by any new enjoyment, as of inflicting misery on others, and gratifying their own pride by comparative greatness. But by him that examines life with a more close attention, the happiness of the world will be found still less than it appears. In some intervals of public prosperity, or to use terms more proper, in some intermissions of calamity, a general diffusion of happiness may seem to be overspread to people. All is triumph and exultation, jollity and plenty, there are no public fears and dangers, and no complainings in the streets. But the condition of individuals is very little mended by this general calm. Pain and malice and discontent still continue their havoc. The silent depredation goes incessantly forward, and the grave continues to be filled by the victims of sorrow. He that enters a gay assembly beholds the cheerfulness displayed in every countenance, and finds all sitting vacant and disengaged, with no other attention than to give or to receive pleasure, would naturally imagine that he had reached at last the metropolis of felicity, the place sacred to gladness of heart, from whence all fear and anxiety were irreversibly excluded. Such indeed we may often find to be the opinion of those who from a lower station look up to the pomp and gaiety which they cannot reach, but who is there of those who frequent luxurious assemblies that will not confess his own uneasiness, or cannot recount the vexations and distresses that prey upon the lives of his gay companions? The world, in its best state, is nothing more than a larger assembly of beings, combining to counterfeit happiness which they do not feel, employing every art and contrivance to embellish life, and to hide their real condition from the eyes of one another. The species of happiness most obvious to the observation of others is that which depends upon the goods of fortune, yet even this is often fictitious. There is in the world more poverty than is generally imagined, not only because many whose possessions are large have desires still larger, and many measure their wants by the gratifications which others enjoy, but great numbers are pressed by real necessities which it is their chief ambition to conceal and are forced to purchase the appearance of competence and cheerfulness at the expense of many comforts and conveniences of life. 
Many, however, are confessedly rich, and many more are sufficiently removed from all danger of real poverty. But it has been long ago remarked that money cannot purchase quiet. The highest of mankind can promise themselves no exemption from that discord or suspicion by which the sweetness of domestic retirement is destroyed, and must always be even more exposed, in the same degree as they are elevated above others, to the treachery of dependents, the calumny of defamers, and the violence of opponents. Affliction is inseparable from our present state. It adheres to all the inhabitants of this world, in different proportions indeed, but with an allotment which seems very little regulated by our own conduct. It has been the boast of some swelling moralists that every man's fortune was in his own power, that prudence supplied the place of all other divinities, and that happiness is the unfailing consequence of virtue. But surely the quiver of omnipotence is stored with arrows, against which the shield of human virtue, however adamantine it has been boasted, is held up in vain. We do not always suffer by our crimes. We are not always protected by our innocence. A good man is by no means exempt from the danger of suffering by the crimes of others. Even his goodness may raise him enemies of implacable malice and restless perseverance. The good man has never been warranted by heaven from the treachery of friends, the disobedience of children, or the dishonesty of a wife. He may see his cares made useless by profusion, his instructions defeated by perverseness, and his kindness rejected by ingratitude. He may languish under the infamy of false accusations, or perish reproachfully by an unjust sentence. A good man is subject, like other mortals, to all the influences of natural evil. His harvest is not spared by the tempest, nor his cattle by the moraine. His house flames like others in a conflagration, nor have his ships any peculiar power of resisting hurricanes. His mind, however elevated, inhabits a body subject to innumerable casualties, of which he must always share the dangers and the pains. He bears about him the seeds of disease, and may linger away a great part of his life under the tortures of the gout or stone, at one time groaning with insufferable anguish, and another dissolved in listlessness and languor. From this general and indiscriminate distribution of misery, the moralists have always derived one of their strongest moral arguments for a future state. For since the common events of the present life happen alike to the good and bad, it follows from the justice of the Supreme Being that there must be another state of existence in which a just retribution shall be made, and every man shall be happy and miserable according to his works. The miseries of life may, perhaps, afford some proof of a future state compared as well with the mercy as the justice of God. It is scarcely to be imagined that infinite benevolence would create a being capable of enjoying so much more than is here to be enjoyed, and qualified by nature to prolong pain by remembrance, and anticipated by terror, if he was not designed for something nobler and better than a state in which many of his faculties can serve only for his torment, in which he is to be importuned by desires that never can be satisfied, to feel many evils which he had no power to avoid, and to fear many which he shall never feel. There will surely come a time when every capacity of happiness shall be filled, and none shall be wretched but by his own fault. In the meantime, it is by affliction chiefly that the heart of man is purified and that the thoughts are fixed upon a better state. Prosperity, allayed and imperfect as it is, has power to intoxicate the imagination, to fix the mind upon the present scene, to produce confidence and elation, and to make him who enjoys affluence and honors forget the hand by which they were bestowed. It is seldom that we are otherwise than by affliction awakened to a sense of our own imbecility, we're taught to know how little all our acquisitions can conduce to safety or to quiet, and how justly we may ascribe to the superintendence of a higher power those blessings which in the wantonness of success we considered as the attainments of our policy or courage. Nothing confers so much ability to resist the temptations that perpetually surround us as an habitual consideration of the shortness of life and the uncertainty of those pleasures that solicit our pursuit and this consideration 
can be inculcated only by affliction. O oh, death, how bitter is the remembrance of thee to a man that lives at ease in his possessions. If our present state were one continued succession of delights, were one uniform flow of calmness and tranquillity, we should never willingly think upon its end. Death would then surely surprise us as a thief in the night, and our task of duty would remain unfinished till the night came when no man can work. While affliction thus prepares us for felicity, we may console ourselves under its pressures by remembering that there are no particular marks of divine displeasure, since all the distresses of persecution have been suffered by those of whom the world was not worthy, and the Redeemer of mankind himself was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. End of section 48